Hello everyone, my name is Nanamar Man, and today we are going to do a lecture on OpenTK or the Open Toolkit 4.x. OpenTK 4.x, I started out at OpenTK 3.x, but 4.x is more of a newer version and it's going to be a bit harder to find like actual tutorials on this one. Uh, yeah, because 3.x was very dominant, I guess, for a while. And apparently I just... Um, Maria, oh boy, there is a PowerPoint presentation and everything. Yes, this one is professional. <laughs> Apparently there is now also a silk.net, which basically does the same thing, kind of, but a little bit extra, uh, which is, open PK and silk.net then, expose open GL, open CL, and open AL, or C sharp, which is what you're going to want to use it for. And mainly open GL for now. That is what the lecture will be mainly about. But if you also want to do some audio stuff, and want to do maybe some computing stuff, then OpenTK will also work. Same with Silk.net, but Silk.net also provides some more um, other stuff. Also provides like Vulkan and uh, Asymp, I think. It, it provides like a whole bunch of, of the libraries, which is pretty cool. It's pretty cool, but I have never heard of it until today, which probably means that it is at least somewhat new. Um, maybe I should mention this is a more of a lecture e type video but of course we are also going to do some coding later on in this video and in the stream which is going to be uh very helpful i think people cheered with one biddies uh, i do actually have cheers disabled on the recording so don't you worry debunked that just does not show up on the recording i don't think Yeah, I don't think that shows up. But anyway, thank you, Lipang. Thank you so much for the cheers. I do appreciate you. <laughs> but Jimmy would say. <laughs> Alright, well, let us continue here because we need to go into a little bit of background on OpenTK and specifically OpenTK 4.x. There is actually a OpenTK 5.x code. OpenTK 5.x coming, but it's kind of like rescheduled. I'm not entirely sure. It says that it was planned for the end of 2021, but it is the beginning of 2022 now, and they don't really seem to be done. So maybe later, but 4.x is the current version right now. It runs on .NET Core 3.1 and upwards, which of course, or at least that's what it's made for, right? So no more .NET frameworks and all of that junk, you just use .NET Core or .NET 5 or .NET 6 or any future .NET versions, which will also work. Hydrate? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Deepant. Well, as already mentioned, it exposes OpenGL, OpenAL, and OpenCL. OpenGL is, of course, the graphics library that we are really going to focus on in this lecture and OpenAL is more for audio. OpenCL is for computing, um, ray tracer stuff, for example, for on your GPU. I made a whole video on that. You, you can look it up. It's probably like a, like a card there or something. Is it as... <laughs> yeah. Th Thanks, Jimmy. That is definitely um, very useful. Very useful. Thank you so much <laughs> for your stuff. OpenTK also does some other stuff though. It exposes some math stuff in OpenTK.mathematics. So it has vectors, it has matrices. Async pronunciation matters. I don't know if it's async or async. I never heard, well, I probably actually did someone else, uh, hear someone else pronounce it, but you know. Chat is in the recording right now, yeah. I might regret that later. I might regret that. But anyway. Yes, so basic linear algebra like matrices and like vectors are also included in OpenTK, which is of course extremely useful for setting up view matrices and such. OpenTK.winnowing.desktop is also there, which allows you to actually make a window. OpenGL is not ready for making a window. It just allows you to write stuff to your window, like triangles and textures and stuff. 
You should title the video trying to give a lecture, but chat interrupts every 10 seconds. <laughs> Hello, destroyed minds. Ah, uh, yeah, Maria, that is um, actually maybe better, but keep it as it is for now. And maybe more importantly, it's a C-sharp wrapper for C code. Of course, C is just uh, the native backend of all of these libraries. But you know, they, you can't really run them natively on C sharp because, of course, C sharp is not a native language. It uses intermediate code and a virtual machine, all of that sort of good stuff. So you can't run it directly. So you need a little bit of a wrapper, and OpenDK provides it. And not just that, it does a little bit extra. Like the game window, which we will see in just a second, it adds a little bit of syntactical flair around it. You know, it has like a nice class with some events, some C-sharp stuff, which will make it very easy for you to actually use it, which is, of course, pretty great. Yeah, we just started. You didn't really miss anything. Also, uh, I'm, I'm sure all of you guys already know most of this stuff. <laughs> All right, well, let us continue then. So as I mentioned for the window, we will have a game window class. There is also a native window class, but for a game, you want to use the game window class. Thank you so much for the cheers, Z points. Appreciate ya. <laughs> Any fancy transitions? I don't know. Well, to me, full newbie, it's to be a good thing. All right, well, everyone, let's uh, continue here then. I'm not sure why I mentioned uh, all of this stuff here again. <laughs> Might have made a small <laughs> error in, in, in my um, presentation here. Uh, this is kind of like copied from the last uh, slide. I suppose I didn't quite delete that, but you know, you know, it is time for a demonstration though. And this demonstration will be quite in depth. So here we go. I already have. A project prepares. It's called OpenDK Tests. Uh, maybe I should have called it OpenDK Lecture, whatever. It's fine. And I have already, and you should of course as well, um, did the NuGet packages. So when we go to install. What I used is system drawing, I'm actually not using anymore. It didn't really work that well. So that's gone. So of course, in NuGet, you're going to have to look for OpenDK. Look, I already looked it up. And then you'll find OpenDK all the way at the top and quite a lot of downloads and you just need to install that. Of course, in here as well, you'll see that it, uh, well, it actually doesn't state which .NET versions are supported, but it will be .NET Core 3.1, .NET 5, .NET 6, and maybe any future .NET uh, versions. Also, uh, we are also using the six .image sharp for now, which you don't necessarily need. But we are going to use that for setting the window icon. You know, mm -hmm. a little icon here, just like in Visual Studio at the top. I've had some questions about that, so I do kind of want to show that. That's not in my original videos, so I think that adds something here. All right, so in our main, in our program class, we can start off by asking OpenTK for a game window, right? We want to make a game window for a game window game window we want to set a new game window now the game window is going to require some settings which are the game window settings we can already see those you will see that i cannot write game window settings game window settings equals game window settings i think there's a default there we go default game window settings and then also we need a native window settings native window settings equals native window settings dot default there we go and with this you can basically get started you can put in the game window settings and the native window settings and this will work and i can show you that it works um of course you would need a game window that run and this is what's going to start the window loop and that is going to actually show the window there we go we can run it and there it pops up it's an open tk window completely default you can basically do whatever you want with it but it's not that great it doesn't have a real icon, it, you know, it doesn't resize properly, and, well, actually we don't really know that much about it. <laughs> Alright, let's catch up on chat here for a second, before we continue. 
100% perfect lecture, yes, of course. Twitch semi froze, but it's back. Hmm. Alright. Yeah, that happens sometimes. Uh, it was a Windows issue. Yeah, that happens. <laughs> Very hungry, frequently asked questions. Will textures be properly covered this time? Um, No, actually. We don't really have time to go uh, that much in depth. This is really just for OpenDK, not for OpenGL. Uh, the time I used to make that texture work. I mean, the texture video, it, it does work, right? Why wouldn't it work? You should get a charger? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> right, so let's go over the settings now. What we can do in the game window settings, we can change only a couple of things. We can change is multi-credit. By default, this is false, I do believe. And basically what it means is it's going to create two threads for you. One that will run your update function and one that will run your render function. And we'll see what those do in just a second. What this implies though is, well, OpenGL only runs on one thread. And the whole context of OpenGL only runs on one thread. This is just OpenGL stuff, doesn't really have much to do with OpenDK, but it is important right here. So if you enable multi-threading, then you can only call OpenGL stuff on your render thread. And if you try to do that on your update thread, you will crash. So if you are a beginner, I would suggest just keeping this at false. Otherwise, if you really need that extra bit of performance, then yes, totally go for true here, set this to true. But for now, we will explicitly set this to false. Then in game window settings, we also have a render frequency. This is just how often we want the, the window to refresh. And it also says something about it here. Uh, values lower than 1 hertz are clamped to 0, and values higher than 500 are clamped to 200. So, well, we probably just want it to be 60, right? 60 FPS is pretty great. I forgot uh, Mega mint filter, mint filters, did I? Did I really do that? Oops. <laughs> well, I am very sorry for your pain. <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> I'm very sorry for your pain, Jimmy. That is um, that's my bad. That, that's my bad. Okay, maybe I should actually comment that in that video then. <laughs> All right, I'll try to remember. So, yeah. Anyways, then we can also set the update rate. No, that, that, that's fine again, right? Then we can also set the update frequency, which in our case kind of has to be the same thing because our update thread and our render thread run on the same thread. So they can't really have much in difference in their frequencies. <laughs> yeah, I missed nothing. Yo, missed nothing, debugs. I'm going to delete that. All right, now we're going to get to the juicy stuff because native window settings has way more settings, as you can see. So first of all, the window icon. I don't know why it's on top, but it's the first option here. So the window icon does nothing on macOS, but it does do something in Windows. And of course, it will set that window icon right here. So we want to set that to something. Now, we can make a new window icon, which requires a new image. However, this image needs a width. For now, we will use 225 for reasons which will become apparent in just a second. And 225 for the height. And then we need some data, some byte data. And as you can see here, this is just the raw RGBA pixel data. Now, this is kind of why we need the six labors of image sharp image. Because, well, in order to get such an array from like a real image, you need some, some real image loading library, which we have right here. So we can say that we want an image specifically of RGBA32, right? That is specifically what it asks for here, an RGBA pixel data. We call it image equals new, actually not new, it's image dot, and then we need to load in Let's see here, we need to load in an image. Get rid of those. By, and then configuration.default, which is just fine. Of course, this is not a um, image sharp tutorial. 
And then the location of our image is in assets slash, and then it is tk.jpg. There we go. And we need to cast that to an image RGBA32. And there we go. And now what we need is we need a byte array pixels equals, and then it is a marshal. Which one was it? I think it was a memory marshal. Dot. And then I think it was as bytes. Yes, as bytes. And then what we can get is we can get the image dot get. And then we can do the try get single pixel span. Oh, right. And because it outputs in its own as an out parameter, we need to make this an out and then a span of the RGBA32. And these are the um, RGBA uh, span. We can just call it a span. There we go. And then we can turn this span into bytes to a byte array. Oh, of course, to array. There we go. So the, mar the, the memory marshal just turns this into a byte span to array into the byte array. We can put that in here, pixels, and then that should work. There we go. And now we can see we have a window with an OpenTK logo right here, right next to the name, which is pretty cool. So that is how you kind of manage these uh, window icons. Now, of course, you can load in an icon like this with any image processing library. Just make sure that, well, you get the right format, otherwise your colors are going to look a little bit weird. It really does need to be RGBA in that order and not some other way around. System.drawing only had ARGB and that just didn't work, right? That's the wrong, wrong order. So that's why I used Image Sharp, which does work. Right, quick catch up with chat. Why not 256 then? Oh, yes. The reason why width and height is 225 is because, well, the tk.jpg, I can't really open that. tk.jpg is 225 by 225 pixels in size. So that is the reason why we're using 225 by 225. I watched a seven hour stream today. I'm kind of tired. It was about shader coding. Have an hour stream, man. Like, and you're just watching it. Ima imagine actually being the streamer. <sighs> Seven hours of streaming without a break is, is is insane. I wouldn't be able to do that. Thank you for the bits, by the way, Deepo. I spent 200 bits if you make 30 setups. I'm not gonna do that today. <laughs> I'm not gonna do that today. We're not going to derail the lecture by that much. Not quite. Not today. That's half an hour stream of your closet. Well, I could do that. I could do that, actually. But in the meantime, let's continue. So we have many more native window settings, right? We can say, is event driven? And this basically tells us if the window is going to update itself or if we need to update it using either the user clicking or triggering some sort of input event or us from some other threat just poking the window and saying, okay, now you can update. So it's event driven for any normal gaming application. It's of course just false. We want the window to update itself and refresh itself. In the window settings also has, well, the icon we did, the API, right. So we have three options for the context API. And that is of course what OpenGL is going to be, right? So we can either do no open AI. And it even says here, this is primary uh, primarily for integrating an external API with this window, such as Vulkan. So basically you could do this if you want to use Vulkan and then you have to do a whole bunch of stuff by yourself. Not something that we are particularly interested in. OpenGL is, I do believe the default, but you can also go for OpenGL ES, which is the embedded systems version of OpenGL, which basically runs on your Samsung smart refrigerator. You could make uh, a game for your Samsung Smart Refrigerator, of course. And for that, you would use OpenGL ES. For us, OpenGL, of course. 
Then, in the new native window settings, we also have the API version, which is of course the version then of OpenGL. Now we can parse a string, so what we want to do here is we want to just set it to the OpenGL version. Well, it does actually say something here. OpenGL 3.3 is the default. OpenGL 4.1 is for more modern apps. And OpenGL 4.6 is for way more modern apps, but it isn't supported by macOS. So for us, we want something modern, but, well, we do kind of like, you know, macOS people. We, we like Apple, so let's just go for 4.1 then. I do believe it's just 4.1 in there. Do correct me if I'm wrong, chat. Do correct me. I've never actually manually set this, set this uh, variable. <laughs> My mom has a, has a smart fridge. Nice. Big fridge moment. Thank you so much for the biddies. Then we also have... Alphabets. We're not going to set all of these bits. Basically, alphabets, blue bits, that bits... Green bits, all these bits flags. Um, they're just going to tell us how many bits per, um, well, whatever it is, right? Alpha, blue, red, green, depth even. Stencil is probably also in here. How many bits per value is going to be in such a buffer? Eight is the default. You know, just one byte per, um, per value. That is just quite normal. That is totally fine. So don't worry too much about that. You're still hungry and gonna get more food, it's a good idea. <laughs> All right, so we're going to just skip these. Yeah, these just should just be default. That's totally fine. I don't know, bindings. Yes, so OpenGL has a bunch of functions that are sort of included in OpenGL, but also sort of not. So some of them you actually need to load in dynamically whenever you start up your program. Well, would you like this to happen for you? Or do you want to do it yourself? That is basically what this says. And for us, and of course for most of you probably, uh, yeah, we do kind of want this to happen for us because, well, why not? <laughs> why would we load it ourselves? Well, you can load all of these functions automatically by just setting this field to true. Of course, this is true by default. Don't even worry about it. In the end, I guess all became in making app for smart fridge, yes. 128 alpha bits, 1 red bit, 420 blue bits, 69, 69, 69 green bits, and 3.5 depth bits. Great suggestion. Love that one. <laughs> Alright, we can also set the monitor. For this one, of course, we probably also just want to use the default. We can make a new monitor handle, which... I do believe only needs like an in pointer. Yeah, so you need a pointer to your monitor. You have some helper functions in monitors. You can like get the monitor from the window. You can build monitor cache, check cache. You can do, you, you can even get the count of how many monitors you have. We're also not really going to bother with this too much. We'll just leave this as default, which of course just gets your default monitor, which in most cases is what you want in any case. Anything else interesting? Yes, we can do the context flags. And these, well, there are a couple of them. I haven't really seen this work too well, so I'm not sure if I'm doing something wrong or if there's like a bug in here. But off-screen indicates that the graphics context is intended for off-screen rendering, yet it doesn't really seem to do anything. Uh, the same with def uh, debug or default or forward compatible, like none of these really seem to change anything. So I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> Not entirely sure, but um, yeah, default is probably just fine. Which of course it already is. Now, let's see, what else? Is full screen? Well, this one is, is kind of self-explanatory. We can set this to true and it will launch in full screen. Then I can access, then I can exit the application. So we're just gonna keep this at false step. <laughs> if you go full screen, of course, like the, the little uh, cross here at the top just disappears. So I can't really, exit out of the application that way. But you might want to set that to true whenever you actually have a UI that you can use. Here we go. Then of course we can set the location. And the location is of course wherever on the screen you want it to be. So you can set this to a vector type, which is of course included in OpenTK. This is part of the mathematics library. And we can set it to like the absolute center of our screen or like the absolute top left. The top left should be zero, zero. So let's see, let's run this. 
Yep, and we get it all the way to the top left. We can't even access the cross anymore. We can't even exit of the application. In the middle, of course, I have a 4K screen. So that means about 2000. And why about 1000? I actually don't know the exact uh, size of my screen right now. It's a little bit over the center. But, you know, you can find whatever the center of your screen is. Usually it's 1920 by 1080, right? So you can do like 960 by 540 and that will just spawn it in the middle of your screen of course for a 4k screen it's not quite the best. this will do for now where's some food nice some burgers hell yeah now we can do a native window and then settings and then let's see if we have any other interesting ones profile didn't we already talk about that i think so Shared context. This one is pretty interesting as well. So what we can do here is we can create a new GLFW graphics context and then we can set it to another window pointer. Guess what that does? Basically, if you already made a window and you already have a OpenGL context, so to speak, what you call it, then maybe you want to create a second window that you kind of want to control with the same OpenGL backend as you're using for your current window. It can be very useful if you want to share buffers, if you want to share textures, share anything. This is very, very useful. So you just put your other window pointer in here. And all of a sudden, your two windows, you'll get two windows that share the same OpenGL resources. So you can load in some stuff on your one window and then display it on the other window. Of course, it will still run on the same thread, so it doesn't really save you anything in that way. But if you want an application that supports multiple windows, which not usually that applicable to games, but for other desktop applications can be extremely nice, uh, then this is definitely the way to go. Didn't talk about profile? Did I not? I thought I just talked about that. Okay, well, let's look at the profile equals. Oh yes, of course, I didn't talk about this one. So uh, Native Windows Systems also has a profile which supports core, any incompatibility. So core is probably what is default. Yeah, it's definitely default. It just uh, does all of the open uh, GL core um, stuff. It supports all of that. Any use for unknown open GL profile or open GL ES. Yes, so with any, I believe you have you know what? Actually, I don't know. <laughs> and compatibility does actually allow you to use legacy code. So you can still use the direct drawing stuff if you use the context profile compatibility. So you can do GL begin, GL triangle, or GL begin, GL vertex, GL end, you know, the direct drawing, which is fabricated for a reason. Don't use that, please. <laughs> I check in once in a while just to make sure nobody skips. <laughs> Great. Yeah, any just is used for unknown OpenGL profile or Open, OpenGL ES. Well, I actually don't know why you would want that. I, I actually don't know why. I can understand why you would need the compatibility, right? Sometimes you just want to port some applications you already have into uh, C Sharp and then you can just copy paste and then you don't need to worry about, oh, this is deprecated code. I can't use that. I have to rewrite everything now. Like, you can just enable compatibility and it will work. This is great. Thank you, Deepank. <laughs> Alright. Default just .core is, is totally fine. For what most people would want. Uh, anything else now? Number of symbols. Uh, uh, start focused. Of course, the size of the window. We can change the size of the window. Also with the vector 2i. We can set it to a width and a height. So let's do 512 by 512. Now we'll get a nice square window that is a little bit bigger than what it used to be. There we go. 512 by 512 in pixels. There we go. We can also... Let's just continue. Start focus, I think that speaks for itself, right? So we can set it to true or to false. Uh, if it starts focused, then... Well, there you go. If I now press WSAD or I click on my mouse... The window will automatically receive those events without me having to click on it or doing anything else. If I set it to false, however, and I run the application, and I would 
press any buttons now. Do you even believe if I just W now? I'm not sure which window is focused. I think my uh, my console is focused, so you can't really see it. But if I were to press like W or anything else now, the window wouldn't receive that event until I click on it and focus it manually. Right? So probably you want this to set the trap. Then we also have da, 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 um, start visible, which of course also speaks for itself. Whether or not the window starts uh, visible. So we can set this to false, then it will start not very visible. Well, there you go. <laughs> so you cannot even see the window. This can be useful for if you don't actually want to render anything, but you want it to use for any computing tasks. So the application is running now, and I, I, I have the console, but no window, no graphics. But let's say I want to use a shader for computing purposes, and I have like a computing shader, then you could totally use this. And yeah, that would work. You wouldn't need a window. So why make a window? Just use computing shaders without a window. So just set the uh, window visibility to false, and it kind of works. Of course, for a game, you want it to be visible. You, you want <laughs> you want something to show up, right? So yeah. Oh no! Oh lord! Oh lord, help me! Oh, a lecture! My toe tuna would love this. Yes. Also, Deepmind suggests using start visible false if you want to make a virus, and I suppose that is true. Not official advice, though. Aha! And then, we have the last couple ones. Of course, sensible bit, red bit, still the same. We can set the title. Oh, we can set the title of the window. And we can just put a string here. So we can call this the open TK texture. There we go. Save it, run it, and then right next to our icon is the open TK lecture. Awesome. Yeah, I think that is pretty simple. It's pretty self-explanatory, but also extremely useful, of course. Uh, the open TK window title is, is great, but you want something that <laughs> resembles your own game, right? So that's what we have there. Then we can have the window border, which we can set to fixed, hidden, and resizable. Resizable is the default. But if we set it to fixed and we run the game, now all of a sudden I I can click, but I, I cannot actually resize the window border, which of course is what you would expect. And that could be nice. That could be nice. If your window or your game doesn't support resizing very well, then maybe setting it to fixed could work. Of course, it doesn't look particularly great, but it could be like a quick and easy fix just, just in a pinch, right? Then we can also have it hidden. Let's see what that looks like. There we go. Now, um, we do actually have this window icon here. So we can still use this icon, but the window is just gone. It doesn't actually exist. So there is no window now, but there is the icon in the bottom. So if you want to make a virus, then this is probably not the way to go, because your icon here will show up in the bottom, in the taskbar. Anything else, though? Yeah, that's gone. Could also maybe be useful. I'm actually not entirely sure why uh, or how that would be useful <laughs> but i'm sure you could come up with something uh, let's change it back to resizable though because that is probably what we want and then the last one all the way to the bottom window state which equals either full screen maximize minimize or normal so full screen we already kind of saw that right we can manually set it to full screen we can set it to maximized which will just give us a very old big window there we go. Oh. Um, for some reason. Oh, oh yeah, of course, because the location of our window is at <laughs> 960 540. The top corner is here kind of well halfway into my screen, and then the rest of the window is just full-sized, which just kind of bleeds over into um, my other window. Which is pretty interesting. Of course, probably not what we want. We could also, of course, start it. Minimize. There we go. And then it will just start down here, but we won't actually see it. But we can, of course, open it and close it. Which is kind of nice. Kind of nice. And that's it. That's really it. 
this is the basic window. Now, inside of our basic window, oh, we probably want to do something else because the game window itself, once we create it, it has a whole bunch of stuff. Now, these settings, you can manipulate all of these settings as you wish, but most of these can also be changed just from the native window settings. So I'm not going to go over all of these. However, there are some interesting events down here. So we really do need to use these. This is basically how you interact with your window. So as you can see, there are a whole bunch of them. They are marked with this little lightning icon. So load is an event that happens whenever the window is finished loading, which means that you actually have all of your OpenGL stuff available whenever this function is run. Which means that kind of right now, if you just created your window and you try to do any OpenGL sort of stuff, it doesn't work because OpenGL hasn't been created yet. OpenGL only gets created after calling the run method here. And after calling the run method, well, the application kind of stops, right? So when you call a run method, it just goes into the method and it starts running the window, which will take an infinite amount of time, basically until you close the application. Now in the dot load method or event, you can subscribe like this, just create a delegate. Da, da, da. Without the delegate, we can just do console.writeline line and then we can say something like load it there we go once we run this we get loaded but only a little bit after we get hello world and you can see that basically the window pops up you get loaded and then it minimizes kind of all at the same time so this only shows up whenever the window is actually loaded then of course we have a whole bunch of these and most of these are very self-explanatory so of course we are going to have things like closed whenever the window is closed Focus change, whether it is focused or unfocused. Key up whenever a key is released. Key down whenever a key is pressed. Uh, maximize, minimize, you know, whenever the window is maximized, minimized. Mouse leave, which means after the mouse leaves the, um, the border of your window. Mouse move, mouse up, move, refresh. Like move is when the window is moved around. Refresh, resize, which is when the window is resized, of course. Text inputs whenever. Uh, a character is pressed, I do believe. What we want to focus on right now is the update frame. So this happens at a specified frequency that we kind of specified right here. Runner frequency is 60 uh, frames per second. So 60 times per second, this update frame event is going to get called. Now, there we go. We actually do get some event arcs here. So we can go to event arcs and it just tells us how many seconds of time elapsed since the previous event. So that is just your update time, right? It should be about 1 60th of a second. But of course, if your program can't keep up, then this will become a little bit larger uh, depending on, on how slow your application actually is. But inside of this update frame is where all of the magic is probably going to happen. You also have, and this is a notable one as well, the update frame. Here we go in the update frame. And this happens whenever your program gets updated. Now, of course, if you run the is multi-threaded false, then there really isn't that big of a difference between these two. But if you have multi-threading on, then the update frame is going to get called from a thread with OpenGL and the or the render frame. Oh, I made this update frame. I meant to set this to render frame. Whoops. And the update frame is going to get called from your update. <laughs> yes, Jimmy, you, you call it. The update frame is going to get called from the update um, thread that does not have OpenGL capabilities. So there is your difference. And of course, if you're multi-threaded, you might call update frame only 20 or 30 times per second instead of 60 times, which is a very normal thing to do. You are back. What did you miss? Uh, nothing. You missed nothing. Well, that was the window part. We now have a functioning window. Hello world, load it. Eh, this thing is minimized right away. I'll actually change that back to just normal. It just starts it at a normal sized window. There we go. Perfect. Let's go back. Here we are. Next frame. So. Let's actually read the chat for a second. <laughs> Hello YouTube, do not skip anything in this video or take or the sandwich people will come and take you. Yes, 
And he is not joking, he is not. And that is definitely not KHSS making it out. Just FYI. Just FYI. Alright, so now that we have the window, what do we actually need to get a triangle on the screen? Well, look with me over here. So first of all, we're going to need to load some shaders. Back in the day, you could do this direct drawing stuff. GL begin, GL vertex, GL color, and then GL ends. And that would draw some things to the screen, but it is particularly slow, not very versatile. And in newer versions of OpenGL, that is no longer supported. So we're going to actually have to make our own shaders. And it is going to be pretty easy, actually. We'll just make some very, very basic shaders that just... Put vertices down on the screen and color them, and that is about it. No transformations, no anything. Of course, shaders are made in GLSL, and that is a special programming language, kind of based on C. And you'll be able to find GLSL, boilerplate code, sample code, just example code, everywhere on the internet. And anything will just work, because it is GLSL, so... Doesn't matter if you're using that uh, shader from GLSL in, in your C code, in your C++ code, in your C sharp code, maybe even in your Python code, it doesn't matter. It's the same absolutely everywhere. So any tutorial that works on C or C++ works on C sharp as well. So keep that in mind. That's pretty handy. Mm, yes, then after we have our shaders, then we have to create some buffers with some data in it. And I really want to emphasize this data aspect. Well, Kind of get back to this later. For now, we will just use some vertices and some colors. Of course, for a triangle, we need three vertices and every vertex needs about three colors. So nine uh, color values in total. Of course, then we need to clear the color buffer because every time that we show a frame, well, in the next frame, we probably want to show something else, right? So we kind of need to clear our frame and specifically the colors, we can also clear the depth and the stamp cell, a stencil and we can clear a whole bunch of stuff that is more in that OpenGL and that is not what this is about. This is just about OpenDK, so let's just try to get going. And just refreshing the colors is enough for a basic triangle. Then we can actually draw the arrays or the buffers that we just created and that will kind of draw those triangles to the screen. And then we can swap the buffers to actually show what we just drew. So in OpenGL, for if you didn't know, there are two buffers. Two screens basically right behind each other. The front screen is what is shown, the back screen is what you're writing to. And after you have just drawn to the back screen, you kind of need to swap them around. So you show the back screen and you can clear and write to well, what used to be the front screen. right? And you just swap them back and forth. And that way you can manipulate whatever is on screen without actually creating some really weird artifacts on screen where you're writing and showing at the same time and then things just get messed up it's weird remember opencl sucks and as long as shaders can be loaded compute shaders can be loaded with the same code and just use this shader program and then do gl dispatch xyz to run it you mean with opencl oh wait remember opencl sucks <laughs> Ah, yes, I read OpenGL. That is why I was confused. OpenGL sucks, and as long as shaders can be loaded, compute shaders can be loaded with the same code, and just use the shader program and then do GL dispatch. Oh, that's actually pretty cool. Now, X, Y, Z is the number of runs, and X, Y, and Z axis. Oh, pretty nice. That is pretty nice. Restaurant needed 13 minutes to deliver my food. That's fast. Yeah, that is actually very fast. Very nice, dude. All right, so that's the plan. Now, specifically on shaders, though. So we can convert, in shaders, we can convert some raw data into an image. And like I said, I really want to emphasize this data aspect. You don't even need to think in, in vertices and colors and normals. I'm counting here, but you just outside the frame. You don't really need to care about vertices or, or colors or normals or anything like that. You can input any type of data in a shader and you can do any sort of manipulation on that data to output an image. But of course, normally you would want vertices and colors and normals because that is kind of the standard and that it is that makes it easy for us to use and it's just very natural to use, of course. But if you have any more wild ideas, it is totally possible with shaders. And Jimmy was just talking about that. 
basically anything that you could want to do, you can do that on OpenGL shaders. Uh, be it on compute shaders or just vertex and 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 track shaders, of course. Everything certain in GLSL, just like I mentioned before. So you can go ahead, go on the internet, search for any GLSL uh, sample codes. You can even go to Shader Toy. Just Google that Shader Toy, you'll find it. And there are some awesome sample GLSL um, well examples there, or little toys as they call them and they just look absolutely incredible it is a great place to learn about glsl as well and like i said it it works on c it works on c it works on c sharp it works everywhere just exactly the same don't worry about that all right demonstration time also before demonstration time apparently i have to hydrate and geometry shaders ah yes the uh underappreciated little brother now, the, the real underappreciated little brother is the tessellation shader. No one uses it. <laughs> Not entirely true, but if you're using tessellation shaders, then, you know, you might as well just um, just, just, just use Vulcan or something. <laughs> then you probably need some, some, some good performance, so might as well use a better, uh, better language. Almost home. Wait, Anna, come on. All right, I will actually wait just for a second. Uh, a quick break, of course normal lecture so there's also a quick break so this is the time everyone i need to get a drink for the redeem hydrate so i'll just go ahead and do that and um, then after that we'll go ahead and implement some shaders very simple very basic but yeah don't want to stretch out the break too much i've had my drink so i think that means it's a uh, demonstration time let's go over Open Skewboard Engine? Yep. Hell yeah. Alright, so I didn't prepare much of this, so we are just going to make some very, very basic shaders. Oh, very, very basic. I mean, very, very basic. Okay. <laughs> so let's here make a little function of a public static void and then create... Well, you can create int, right? Create shader. And in here, we are just going to call all of the shader code, right? All, all of the loading shader parts. First of all, maybe we should actually write our shaders. I usually like to just put it in assets. We can add a, a new file, new item, and then we need a file. Let's see if we can find anything. Can we just get anything? Hello. Bitmap file, no. Da, da, da. Can I actually not just create a normal file? Huh. Oh, here, text file. So <laughs> we can create a vertex shader.glsl. I like to end my, uh, my shader files in GLSL. Of course, you can do basically whatever you want. You can even end it with txt. But GLSL just makes it clear that this is a GLSL language file and therefore you should load it as a GLSL language file. Now we can get started with a version. Um, I suppose we are at version uh, number 410. I think it's hashtag version, isn't it? Uh, 410. Then we need to... You enter shader files and... Ah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great idea. Ah, oh, it still doesn't work. That is very strange. <laughs> GPU crash, yeah. Right, well, let's uh, let's try it. Then we can make a layout and then it could be like position equals zero. Oh, I should have prepared like a little bit. And then this can be a... Oh, I, I'm all confused with um, OpenCL. You know what? I'm, I'm going to get a, a cheat sheet open. <laughs> Just in case I mess anything up. Yeah, I haven't written the shader in uh, like a couple months. Shouldn't be too bad. But for some reason, I'm not entirely sure anymore. Um, Let's go to... Da, 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 keyboard engine, keyboard, keyboard engine, assets, shaders... Product shader, open that thing. 
Big sneeze. There we go. Right, yes. Then we can have a layout location equals zero. Yes, exactly. I was already thinking. So layout location equals zero. I'll explain what that means in just a second. Add with an in. And then we can start with clothes. All about this effect three. The data. So what we do right here, well, we can just call it uh, vertices actually. So what we do here is we're going to specify a certain location and we'll get back to that location in just a second. And in this case, it will be location zero where we are going to input um, vector threes, which will be vertices into our shader. And vector threes are just three dimensional floats right? in X, Y, and Z for a position which will be the vertices of our triangle. Of course, we need three vertices. So this thing will have three vertices in total. Now this vertex shader, as it is called, and as it might suggest, will be run for every single vertex. So that is why this is not any form of array or something, because this, is, this whole shader is just run three times, once for every single shader. So once for every single vertex. So it will only input one vertex, right? We also need something similar. Hey, night lights. When no, not Minecraft. Ah, oh yeah, that is sad. That is true. <laughs> we also will need some colors, so we can do a location equals one for in vec three and then colors. Now. Colors, RGB, we could also do RGBA, in which case we would need a four dimensional vector, but we'll just do RGB for now. I think that is just about fine for what we are going to try to use. Then just like in C, we're going to have to start with a main function. And this main function is basically all that uh, this thing does. Basically, whenever we run the shader, we just run this main function. So this is where we're going to have to do all of our juicy stuff. And the main juicy stuff that we want to do here is just set the GL position. GL and then capital position. So this is a four dimensional vector that tells OpenGL exactly where to draw your, um, your vertex. Now OpenGL draws by default between minus one to plus one. So X can be minus one to plus one and Y can be minus one to plus one. That will cover the entire screen. Now, if you have a world that is, let's say, 1920 by 1080, then you would need some form of a projection matrix to squeeze that world down into the minus one, the plus one, and the minus one up to plus one range. For now, we will just write everything in minus one to plus one range. So we don't even have to care, care about that. We can just create a vec4 that will start off with our vertices. And then the W coordinate will just be 1.0. Usually you don't really have to care about the W coordinates. 1.0 is, is just fine. I do believe 0.0, .0 should also work, but just, just use 1.0 and then you'll always be good. Because there are some matrix manipulations you want, that you might want to do later, and for that you probably do want uh, a 1.0. Meow, 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 meow. Meow. Yeah, we have to score the, the cat person. Meow. Meow. So we're also going to have to pass through our input color because we're going to need a second shader to handle the actual drawing to the pixels. Because this, of course, only handles where the vertex will be drawn on the screen. But it doesn't actually handle the drawing itself. So what we can do is we can do a out. And let's uh, look at this. We can do an out. Back three. And then the out color, there we go. And then inside of main, we can say that out color equal colors. There we go. Right, so I do want to stress that here in main, you can really do anything. So you can just create a vec3, which we'll just call vector a equals, of course, new doesn't exist here. A vec3 of 1.0, for example. And with that, well, we can do anything we can make a, a vec 3b which is called uh, vec 3 and then maybe it is 2.0 for every single value of course we can do 1.0 and 2.0 and then 3.0 f 
So then you can even like do dot products or cross products. So let's do like a like float. D is like a dot product of uh, well A and, and, and B, and you can like use that. Uh, like put it there. This is all totally possible. You can do whatever you want in here. Now we're not going to use any of this, but I just want to stress that it is possible to just do whatever you like. Right then, we need a second shader that instead of just putting some some vertex somewhere in in like screen space, it actually generates the pixel colors, like the output colors that um, OpenGL needs to produce on the screen. So that is called the fragment shader. .glsl. Now the fragment shader also needs like the hashtag version three or why we are using four ten. There we go. And it also has a void main. There we go. And we can use an in vec3 and then call it out color. I suppose I should give it a different name then. This should just be the frag color in here. Frag. Oh, I'm not sure what button I just pressed there. And frag color. So in vertex shader, this is a shader that will run first and it will output the frag color. And then the next shader, which will be the fragment shader, it will input that same frag color. So that is how you can communicate between the different shader stages. Communicating backwards doesn't work because the fragment shader is called after the vertex shader. And so, well, going back in time is, is something that we haven't really discovered yet. Maybe in the future, who knows? I'm gonna go have a uh, leave a little earlier today. I'm pretty tired. That is okay, Maria. You have a good night. Thank you for coming. Little MP3 file. It belongs to me, and I think you will like it. All right, I'll check it out in just a second. I could totally just spam bits. You cannot disable that, but I think I don't do it. Only for you. Well, thank you, Deepwind. <laughs> thank you for that. What we also need is we need an out vec four, and that will be the out color. Unlike in a vertex shader, which has a predefined GL position variable that you can output to, uh, the fragment shader doesn't have that. You have to define your own vector for output color. You can give this any name you like, but it needs to be an out vec4. And what you can do then is you can say that the out color equals, uh, for us it will be a vec4, of course, RGBA, of the uh, frag color which will be the first three values, and then the last value will just be 1.0, f. So we want this um, alpha just to be one all the time. I think that makes sense. I think most people would want that. You can, of course, uh, do some transparency in here if you really like that. For now, we're not going to. Because Fragment Shader is the last stage of shading, of course, this is where actually uh, the colors get written to the pixels. There is nothing after this. So outputting things here doesn't make any sense, ex except, of course, for outputting the actual color. Also, I should mention that the fragment shader is run for every single pixel. Uh, well, that is between, well, whatever shade or whatever shape has been rasterized by the rasterization step. This is not a step that you can manipulate or anything, but basically you have the vertex shader, then you have a rasterization uh, stage, and then you have the fragment shader. And for every single little pixel within this shape that you just created with your vertices, this function will be called. Right, and it will automatically interpolate between different frag colors that you output. So if you output uh, red at one vertex and you output blue at the other vertex, then in the middle you'll have like a purple-ish color, right? Red, blue mix. It will automatically do that for you. And then this should kind of work. So now let's go ahead and try to load this stuff in. So what we can do here so of course we can just return uh, zero for now, but we're going to return like a popper shader. So what we can do is so we can do gl dot, and then we can go to shader, and then we should find here sort of like a create a shader of a shader type. So the shader type that we want is well, there are quite a couple of them, but that we want is a vertex shader, and of course a fragments shader. So another one, and that will be the fragments shader. So this will be the V shader. Of course, it needs to be an integer. And the integer F shader. Thank you so much for the 100 bits department. That is actually awesome. 
Oh, this is, uh, yeah, there we go. V shader and F shader. That's proper naming. Uh, these shaders, of course, are integer. This is just OpenGL stuff. Really doesn't have much to do with OpenDK, but we're just going to try to get a triangle on screen, right? OpenGL just creates these objects and then it returns like a reference in the form of an integer to that object. But it keeps the object itself somewhere in the background away from, well, you, apparently. <laughs> but you can manipulate now this shader using these integers. So we can do gl dot and then shader source where we can input the shader uh, reference or like integer. So product shader. And then we can just input a string. Now for us, we can just do file dot read all text and then just the file name, which will be backslash 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 and then assets slash. And then the vertex shader will be vertex underscore shader dot glsl. And for the fragment shader, there we go. It will be the app shader. And this will be the fragment shader file, glsl. All right, see you in a second debug. Then we need to do gl.compile shader, which also requires this index. So it knows which shader to compile. Good for both product shader and, and fragment shader. Then we can even get like gl dot um, shader info get shader info log, which will return a string based on which shader you input. So we can just get the v shader, and we can get the f shader, and actually both we can just directly log to the console. So we can just do console dot right line, and now if anything goes wrong when compiling these shaders, well it will be outputted to the um, console which is very handy to know. So if you made any syntactical errors, then this get shader info log will tell you exactly where uh, where it is and what it does. Of course, you could check if there's actually anything in this log, because of course, if you did everything right, you might not want to actually just print a new line because that's all it's gonna do then. But you know, this is kind of quick and dirty. So this will, this will be just fine. Then we actually need to create the shader program which is just the complete program of running all of the shaders, right? And we have two, so we need to like bind two to this program. You can do gl dot and then shader program. It's just called a program in uh, OpenGL, my bad. Program, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Did I miss anything? Create program, there we go. Then we can do Attach shader to the screen program. Oh, um, ah, yes. So this will still have the program. Yeah, okay. So we need to specify which program we want to attach to, and then the shader that we want to attach. So program and V shader. We want to do the same thing with the F shader, of course. Both need to be attached to this program. Then we can do gl.link program, which needs, of course, this program. This will link the program with these two shaders attached. Then we can deattach. Uh, is it unattach or is it deattach? It's detach, I think. Yeah, it's detach shader, which will separate the shader from the uh, program, which allows us to actually delete these shaders. So delete shader of the shader, and we can also delete the app shader. If these shaders are still bound to the program, you cannot delete them. Well, you can, but OpenGL doesn't actually delete them until they are detached. So it will just kind of sit there and take up memory. So detach first, then delete. And then after we link the program, we can also get an info log. So a program info log from the program, which will tell us if anything went wrong with the linking stage of a program. Usually something already goes wrong in the shader info log. Linking is usually not a problem. All right. Once all of this um, does a thing, we can return the program. There we go, and we can use it. Of course, uh, we don't actually have any asserts or any other, you know, error checking. So if anything does go wrong, we just print it to the program and then we return the program anyway. Or we print it to the console and then we return the program anyway. Again, it's quick and dirty. You probably want some error handling in here. So there we go. Now what we can do is before we run the window, no, not true, in the load function that we have here, 
we can go ahead and load our shaders. Remember that outside of this load function, we do not actually have any OpenGL capabilities, which means that, well, loading a program without actually having OpenGL, well, all of these GL build functions will fail. And so really nothing will happen. So you really need to go and wait until the window is properly loaded. OpenGL is created. So we are here in the load part. So we can do uh, int program equals and then the create shader. They'll just do that for us. Then we can do gl.use uh, program. Program. That will just use the program for us. And then, well, we could do this every single frame, but for this program, we're just going to use the same program for this application. We're going to use the same program every single time. So we can just use it once and then it will just kind of sit there and be used. If you want to use multiple, pro multiple programs, that is totally possible. Just use one program and then whenever you want to use the other one, just GL use program and then the other program. And that'll just work. All right. Well, that is the shaders. Uh, let's go back to our, our presentation then. There we are. Now we have the buffers stuff. So what we need to do, well, buffers are basically little arrays that are stored on the GPU, so on the graphics cards of your system. And that means that you can load in some data, let's say like colors and vertices or normals or anything else, and store that stuff on your graphics card. And that means that in your shaders, you will be able to access them, which is very, very useful, of course. Now, we will need vertices and colors. Well, let's uh, make those in a little demonstration. This is Michael Mac. All right, hope to see you back soon. I went one too far, but that is okay. All right, well, let's see this here. So what we can do after creating the shaders, we can also create some buffers. Uh, static, uh, I suppose it should be void, create buffers. There we go. And here we can have like a ref int. Do remember that you will need a ref keyword here. Ref int, and then we need a vertex buffer and a ref int color buffer. Now these refs are just basic C sharp, right? So if you don't use refs here, then if you store anything in these buffers, then well, that isn't saved. And we do want to save it, right? We want to return these values. We'd also use outs, that might actually be even better. There we go, use some outs. Now, this basically works very similarly to how anything else in OpenGL works. We will just have to uh, gen buffers or create buffers. Create buffers. Uh, I think I usually use gen buffers. It's fine, this will just create one. Int, and this will be, uh, well, we can just use the vertex buffer here equals the one gem buffer, and then the color buffer equals the other gem buffer. Deepunk, thank you so much for the 100 biddies. Very much appreciated. And then what we are going to need is we are going to need to populate these buffers. So gl does, and then buffer data. There we go. And the buffer target here can be an array buffer, which just means that we want to set an array. There are a whole bunch of these, like you can do stuff with Atomics, you can do copy stuff, pixel, pack, buffer, there are a whole bunch of these. This is just OpenGL again, so if you want to find out more about this, then do look up some OpenGL uh, references online, OpenGL tutorials, and all of that will apply to OpenTK as well, or at least the OpenGL part of OpenTK. Now, the size of this buffer is the number of bytes that we need to store in this buffer. So we want three vertices, each of which contain three floats. So that is three times three is nine, but then a float is four bytes. If you don't know that, that's fine. You can even do like size of float, which will just return four. And that will set the right number of bytes there. Then we can actually put in some data. Now this can just be a, an array. So we'll just do that, float uh, array. There we go. And in this array, we want a minus open by F. 0.5f for the x minus 0.5xf for the y and 0f for the z. 
Then again, plus 0.5f for the x, minus 0.5f for the y, and 0.0f for the z. And then lastly, for the last perplex coordinate, we need a 0.0f for x, we need a plus 0.5f for y, and a 0.0f for z. So we're just going to get a triangle like this, right? We're going to get a triangle like this, which will uh, be exactly what we need. And then lastly, the buffer usage hint. Now, this is just a hint, so it is not necessarily super, super useful. Um, ah, I put this closing bracket in the wrong position. It doesn't guarantee that OpenGL will use this, but we can use a static copy here. And again, you can look all of this stuff up, but static basically means that we're never going to actually change the data inside of this buffer. And copy means that, well, it is going to copy this data. So it's it's like read-only, basically. Read-only on the graphics card side. Buffer usage is actually working. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So, so usually it is working, but it, it's no guarantee that it will work. Right? It's, it's, it's a hint. So usually OpenGL will do that, but I believe that if you set it to static anything and then you just change the buffer data anyway, OpenGL is not always going to complain about that. It might, but it also might not. Which is very nice and consistent, but in principle it might not complain depending on uh, what environment you're running on, what like, the implementation is, all of that sort of stuff. So yeah, good times. Anyway, now we are going to need to do the same thing for our colors. It's the same size, right? Three times three, so we can keep that all the same. Now the colors cannot be negative, of course. So we want red in one corner, which is one, zero, zero. We want blue in the other corner. Uh, or well, green, I guess, in this one, and then blue in the last one. O, R, G, and... There you are, also set a copy. There we go. And that should already be it. Now I should be able to just grab these. There we go. We can grab these and put these in the load function. Of course, we're going to need to use this in other positions as well. So we might also just very quick and in a very quick and dirty way create the buffers in a render function. I know it's not great, but again, it's sample code, right? Uh, one will be the vertex buffer, and the other one will be the color buffer, and this will be, of course, an int. There we go. So we'll get these two out. All right, well, that is the buffers then. And then here in this last little step, I really did go one too far to the back. Can I access that? I don't think so. Suppose we can look at this quick triangle frame here. So what was it again exactly that we wanted to do? Well, we need to load the shaders. Well, we did that. We need to create the buffers. Well, we did that as well. Then we need to clear the color buffer. Important, still need to do that. Draw the erase and swap the buffers. All right, let's do that. So we need to clear. We can do that with gl.clear. And then whichever clear mask. So we have the color buffer, the accumulator buffer, the coverage buffer, death buffer, and sensor buffer. We want to clear the color buffer, which clears the color, of course. Now, usually you might also want to clear like, the depth buffer, but we don't have depth testing enabled, so it doesn't really matter right now. Then we want to create the buffers. Of course, we already have the program bound here. Then we need to do the gl.draw arrays. We need the primitive mode of the triangles. The first one is zero, and the count is three, and the number of indices to be rendered, yeah. So we have three vertices, so we need to render Three vertices starting at zero. Oh, that makes sense. And then lastly, we need to do the swap buffers. Uh, that is a window, a game window function. Swap buffers. Again, that will just swap the front and back buffers. So what we just drew to will be shown to whoever is watching. Not quite done yet though, because we create these buffers. Then of course we also need to bind them. Bind buffer again. Uh, these buffer targets need to be the same everywhere. So array buffer. And that can be... Ah. We are going to need VAOs, aren't we? We're going to need VAOs. Alright, well, let's very quickly make a VAO then. 
So with buffers, you can only really have one buffer bound at the same time. But if you want to draw multiple buffers at the same time, like a uh, well, color and vertex buffer, you'll need a VAO, well, uh, which is just a vertex array object, which will combine a bunch of buffers into one little bit of data. Right? One little pointer that points to all of the buffers that you're going to need for your render call. What we need right here then is we also need a index buffer. Unfortunately, we'll need a third one then. That gen buffer. This one, uh, all of these can now be ints because we're not going to use any of those anymore. There we go. Good return. Need VAO. There we go. And we're going to have to create a VAO. Equals GL gen vo you can use the array buffers if you're only using one um one buffer if you would only use vertex buffers but no colors no problem at all you just use uh, draw arrays you just create one buffer bind a buffer draw arrays and just set the color manually inside of your fragment shader which is totally fine as well gen vertex array there we go there we need to gl that binds. Oh, I completely forgot here to bind as well. The bind, the array buffer. Vertex array buffer and then the vertex buffer. There we go. We also need to bind the VAO. Vertex array. Bind it, I suppose. Bind vertex array of the VAO. Then we can here set the buffer data. Of course, you first need to bind it and then you can set the buffer data. Then we can set the pointer. So the vertex attribute pointer. Let's see where it is. Vertex attribute array pointer. There are a lot of functions in here. Attributes array pointer. Enable vertex attribute array. We need that one as well. We need to enable zero and we need to enable one in here. Also enable one. These points to whichever locations you use here. So layout location zero and layout location one. You need to enable these right here. Of course, this isn't how to write a game engine. This is how to learn OpenGL. Don't write a game engine like this. It's inefficient and not expendable. Absolutely. Great advice, Carlfin. Yeah, don't do what I do. <laughs> Um, GL. And now I forget exactly what the function is called. It is like the attribute pointer. Get vertex attribute pointer, set vertex attribute pointer. I think it's this point. Vertex attrib pointer. That one. There we go. The vertex attribute pointer. Do watch out if you're using this. If you are not referencing uh, floats in here, um, in here, if your vertices are integers or your corals are integers or whatever data you're using are integers, then you have to set this not a vertex attribute pointer, but a vertex attribute i pointer for integers. It's gonna make sense, but if you don't know exactly what that does, then well, you're going to run into issues because then it's going to read in your integers, convert them to floats, and then convert them back to integers, and then you'll get all sorts of messed up data. Not to put down the tutorial, this is a great learning point. Yes, absolutely. If you, especially if you want to do commercial work, you're going to have to put in a little bit more work than like what I can write up in two hours, right? <laughs> With being um, you know, it's not like I'm just constantly writing here for two hours either. All right, so uh, this function is going to set the buffer that we just currently bound and that we currently set the data to. It's going to point that buffer to this location that we also just enabled. It doesn't really matter exactly where you enable it, I think. It's just that you enable it before drawing. So I usually enable the vertex attribute array after uh, binding it to um, the buffer. Let's see here. So it was again. Here we go. Yeah. So the index is the position, which will be zero for this one. The size is the number of, uh, well, whatever we're accepting. In our case, floats. We have three floating points per vertex, so this needs to be a three. 
This is the type. Here we can say that we expect floats. Normalized is false. That doesn't really apply to us. We don't want to normalize anything. Uh, then the stride is zero and the offset is zero. I'm not going to go in, into depth on what stride and offset all does. It's not really relevant right now. Just leave it at zero and um, look up some other tutorials <laughs> for more information on that again. Um, then we need to do basically the exact same thing, but then here for the colors. So we need to bind and then the color buffer and then set that color buffer to, well, whatever we already had. And then of course, bind that color buffer as well to its layout location. This of course is index one, size three, float, false. It's still exactly the same, which is great. We kind of need to do something similar now, however, for the index buffer. Here we go. So I believe we might be able to do without an index buffer. Let's... Uh, I'm not sure. I never really do any of this stuff without an index buffer, so let's just do it with an index buffer. Just like always. Index buffers aren't really useful right here, but index buffer do allow you to use or reuse the same vertices for well, different things. So let's say that you have a, a square, which consists of two triangles. Then you'll see that two vertices on those two triangles kind of overlap. So why would you draw six vertices where two are basically exactly the same, when you can also just draw four vertices and just reuse those two? That is what indices are for. Very useful for when you're drawing large meshes, for example, but for just one triangle, it really doesn't do anything. What we need to do is just draw uh, or specify the drawing order. So we will just need three integers with an integer array, which will just say, I want to draw vertex zero first, then I want to draw vertex one, then I want to draw vertex two, and then we're done. It's that simple. And also set a copy there as well. Yep. And then in here, we will also then have to do an out, int, and this will be the index buffer. There we go. Just to make sure that the index buffer also gets returned. There we go. Um, I completely removed that. That's not exactly what I meant. I want to return or delete the integer. There we go. Perfect. Now in the create VAO, create. No, not that one. Create VAO. We will get an integer VAO back and also an output integer, which will be the index buffer. Oh, by the way, do not forget to actually delete whatever you just created. Uh, first of all, we need to, of course, return the VAO. And we also need to GL and then delete buffer. And then the vertex buffer, just like what we did with the shaders. Once we're done with these, once we have basically put these buffers or copy them over into a VAO, we can just delete them afterwards. We don't really need them anymore. Do make sure that they're no longer bound, but because we are binding the index buffer last, the color buffer and vertex buffer are already unbound, so we can just get rid of them. I do think you do also need to unbind the VAO to unbind something in OpenGL, just call the bind function and put a zero there. Then it will bind the default zero or null buffer, which does nothing. Right, it's unbound. We also need to delete then the color. There we go. And with that, there we go. There we have it. Then in our render frame, we're going to load in or create this VAO. Then we can gl dot draw elements instead of drawing the arrays we can now draw elements because we now have an index buffer which contains the elements that we want to draw that is why it is called that way so we want to draw triangles that is the type that we want to draw of course um, we still have three elements that we want to draw three different vertices draw element type is well we have unsigned integers in here right i just specify here an int array of 0, 1, 2, so it can be a uint error. There you go. Of course, the same size, so it doesn't really matter. So the type of indices that we use is this unsigned integer, and then the indices should be 0. This is very confusing, and I got that one wrong a couple of times. If you actually input the index array in here, you get a whole bunch of issues. What you need to do instead is just do gl and then bind buffer. 
then of course the buffer target array buffer just like always and then the index buffer you just need to bind it before calling to gl draw elements and then you'll be fine speaking of which we also need to bind the vertex array bao that we intend to draw after we draw we can bind of course bind vertex array then zero which means that we are going to unbind it then we can bind buffer bind buffer of course the uh, array buffer and then also zero here to unbind the index buffer this simply allows us to delete the two so we can delete the index buffer and we can gl dot delete vertex array yeah this is incredibly inefficient just creating a vao and then deleting it right after especially when you don't actually change anything so you might want to create the vao here in the load function and delete it in the unload function or like the window close function for us though because it's a simple example we're going to be a little bit a little bit dirty here but this should work okay well let's see if it does because that's actually uh probably won't <laughs> yes exactly all right so everyone i made a big mistake i did uh i found here the buffer the index buffer to just a normal array buffer but it should be an element array buffer because of course it stores the elements of our triangle oh yes so i kind of messed that one up i'm very sorry that's uh, a lot of stuff to remember sometimes so that's unbind the buffer that we had bound then we can delete the vertex buffer and the core buffer there we go everything is properly deleted then we can also delete the vertex array and the of course the element array buffer uh the index array after we draw and then this should this time draw the triangle there you go uh, this is a nice little triangle with, of course, the red corner, the blue corner, and the green corner without any memory leaks, as you can see, which is great, but not particularly efficient. If you were to try something like this at home, then I do encourage you to make exactly this. But if you try to expand it in any way, shape, or form, then do consider not creating a new video every single frame, but just uh, doing it once, maybe two or three times however often you actually need to recreate your buffers and then storing the results somewhere and rendering that result and only deleting it whenever you actually cannot use it anymore you know it, it's a lot more efficient that way anyways let's go back to the presentation and then we have kind of come to the end of this lecture which is great um well a little bit bittersweet but you got through it all which i commend you for that some important notes though some, some very important notes opengl double equals opengl kind of sort of which means that opengl in c or c++ is actually kind of the same as opengl anywhere else and i can show you this right here in the opengl and then No, that's not the right page. Open jail and then the um, reference page. There we go. And here we are. An open jail reference page. One of many. You can just Google for whatever you want. Let's say you just Google for um, the GL buffer data, one of the functions that we use today. Of course, for us, it's GL dot buffer data. So whenever you translate, just get rid of the dot. And then you should be able to find it here on the chronos.org website. And this page just explains anything that you need to do. So GL buffer data, it accepts a target a size, a void pointer data, and a usage. Of course, void pointers and any pointer type related stuff. In OpenDK, you can usually just put an array in. So if you read pointer, just read array and you're good. It then tells you exactly what you can use and what it can be used for. So the GL array buffer for the targets. Well, that is good for vertex attributes. And the GL and then the elements array buffer, which is right here, is good for vertex array indices. Well, awesome. Good to know that stuff. It's all here on this reference page. Of course, the buffer specifies the name of the buffer. 
or the GL named buffer data function. Uh, the size, the size and bytes, of course, the data points to the data, or in our case, an array that actually has the data inside, and then the usage, which also specifies which enums you can put in for a usage. And it even explains to you exactly what that all means. So this is a great page to begin with anything OpenGL Red Edit, and then you can quite easily translate that back to what it should be in OpenTK, right? So GL buffer data just turns into GL dot buffer data. You can use that. GLSL, on the other hand, is exactly GLSL in every single language because GLSL is a language, so it's always the same. If you find any tutorials on that, then it will always work in OpenTK as well, which is extremely nice, of course, if you're working on anything and you get stuck, you just Google something and then someone will definitely have a solution for you in GLSL and you can basically just copy paste the code. Don't always copy paste the code. Try to actually learn what you're doing but it is a possibility. And yes, the specifications for uh, OpenGL are always available to you and will always help you. Will I make a GL uh, debug function now? I don't think so. I don't think I will debug. And yes, uh, this is going to be a video and when will this be published? I cannot publish this before tomorrow, so I'll probably publish this on Wednesday, right? Because I usually upload around like six, seven-ish. Um, and my Twitch affiliate contract doesn't allow me to upload this video until, well, 24 hours after the, 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 the stream has ended. So then I would only be able to upload it at like quarter past 10 tomorrow. It's probably gonna be Wednesday. Gives me a little bit of extra time as well to just cut things uh, a little bit more nicely. Yeah. Um, maybe I can just very quickly mention OpenGL does also provide debug functions. Now, you can look this up on the internet. I don't have time for that right now. On the internet, it explains exactly how to do any of that in C++ and C. In OpenDK, even very specifically, I do believe. And uh, otherwise, you can translate it, which is very nice. Again, this is not an OpenGL video. This is an OpenDK video. We only just demonstrated how to use OpenDK for, uh, as an example. Yes, so everything is very crude and dirty. Um, but I do hope that you enjoyed this video or the stream. Would you like to catch this stream or another stream live next time? Then do go down below and click on that Twitch link and then you'll get right to my Twitch channel where I stream daily from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. CET, approximately. Um, well, except for in, in, like weekend, in the weekend. I only stream during weekdays, Monday through Friday which is great. Next week, we'll probably uh, do some C stuff, some just very basic C stuff, which is gonna be great. I might even do another lecture type video on C, even though I know not that much of C, but I'll try to learn it for you guys. <laughs> and give a quick overview of what you can all do with C, after which we will then continue to do, well, a lot of programming in C in the next week. Do you now work on Cuboid Engine? Uh, yes, after this, tomorrow, I want to make uh, the, sh the, the, the engine ready for my port, basically. And after that, so Wednesday through Friday, I'm probably just going to do some, some Minecraft, either making mods or just playing Feet the Beast for a little bit. The next week, we'll get started with, uh, with the C ports. Maybe I'll set up, actually, a basic C environment already this week. I mean, now today, well, it's, it's already past 10. I'm going to end the stream pretty soon here. going to end the stream pretty soon here. Um, oh, yeah, I should also say, for uh, the viewers at home, also, um, join the Discord. There's a link down below as well. Uh, everyone is super helpful there. If you have any questions about anything OpenTK or OpenGL related, we are there. I am there. A bunch of other people are there. Great people who are well, amazing at it, and who can help you with practically anything. So do not hesitate and uh, come over. <laughs>